TypeScript has empowered our code in so many ways, but its type safety has limits. And these are most apparent when it comes to error handling. It's really not TypeScript's fault though. Exceptions are just a part of JavaScript. Any code can throw any value at literally any time. And exceptions have their merits. They remove the need to handle errors by default, and they usually crash the entire program as soon as they occur. This is pretty much the behavior you want when you're writing small short scripts, but as we all know, we're not using JavaScript to write small short scripts anymore. We're writing real applications, and this is where error handling starts to matter a lot more. Well, then you say it's easy. We have typed return statements, just add typed throw statements, right? Problem solved. But it actually doesn't work this way, and the TypeScript team has rejected this kind of proposal again and again. But why? It comes down to the difference between expected and unexpected errors. Expected errors are, of course, expected. We create them purposely as part of our logic and meaningfully handle them where required. And so this means that we know what types they are because we create them. Let's check out a little example that I hope will explain why. So here I've created a short little example of a divide function that takes two numbers and throws an error if the divisor is zero. And I've added in this little comment, which we're gonna pretend is real. Like we're gonna pretend this, this throw statement um, is a, a part of the language and um, this is not a comment. And so if we go to a little example of using this function, right, we put the call in a try block and we catch, and you'll see that we already have a type error, um, right? We can't access properties on the type unknown. And you're probably saying, well, of course it's unknown, right? You, you said it was unknown and this, this syntax, right, it's not actually real. But the point I wanna get across is that even if this syntax was real, even if this was a part of the language, that E is still unknown here. We actually can't get any better. And the reason is unexpected errors. Unexpected errors are just that, unexpected. They could happen at any time for any reason. And of course, we're not gonna know their type, right? It's gonna be unknown. The problem is that by default, JavaScript conflates these two. Unexpected errors and expected errors are sent through the same channel. If you look at other languages like Go or Rust, for example, they have a panic function. That is the equivalent of an unexpected error. But by default, they have other kind of solutions. What this means is that when we catch, we could get an expected error, but we also could get an unexpected error. And so because the unexpected error is of type unknown, that any time we have like some information about the expected error, the type is just gonna be unknown or the type of the expected error. So let's put that in and see what happens. And so even if I add that to the catch type, we still get an error, right? We still have to do some kind of runtime check um, to get the type error to go away. And so even if this throws declaration statement was true, we haven't really gained any meaningful type level information. We've gained basically a documentation statement. And so that's why this proposal has got rejected. It could basically be a JS doc comment. Take this for example. This provides the same level of information and doesn't require introducing new syntax to the language. But we can definitely do better than try catch. Let's leave exceptions and catch for unexpected errors because it actually handles that case quite well. And so where else can we put expected errors? Well, the only other place we can through the return type. And this is most often done through some kind of result type. So let's look at what an implementation of that might look like. So here's what a really basic implementation looks like. I created two types, a success class and a failure class. And if you're wondering why I'm using classes, by the way, it's actually just the fastest way to declare both a type and a value constructor at the same time. And then we create a result type, which is just the union of either two. And so let's look at what re-implementing our divide function looks like now. So here we have our new divide function. And as you can see, the result type is no longer number, it's result number or divide by zero error. And when we use it in our code, we now get back this result and we then check if it's a failure. And if so, we handle the other case or we can know it's a success and access the value. So even with this quite basic solution, we've already achieved type safe errors, which is a really great improvement. But let's take a look at a bit larger function using this pattern. So for this next type, I created two new error types called foo error and bar error. And I declared two new functions called mayfail1 and mayfail2, which are basically just some function that may fail with an additional reason. Our new main function follows a very common pattern where we actually don't handle any of the specific errors in line, instead just returning them up for the caller to deal with. And so you'll start to see that when we do this with multiple functions that might error with this pattern, it can kind of get a bit explicit. Even though in this function, we're not actually doing any error handling at all, we're just looking at the possible success case, we still have to explicitly check and handle every single error site, which is fine, right? Like this is basically what Go does, but I think things can be a little bit better. And then one other small problem with this approach is that I manually annotated the return type here, but if we delete it and look at the inferred one, you'll see that it's not super nice. And we get this kind of like failure or failure or success. And it'd be ideal if we could just merge this into like one nice result type. Some of these issues can be addressed if we take a kind of more functional approach. So I added two methods to both the success and failure classes. And we can take a look at what those look like. One is called map and the other is called flat map. 
Map is a function that allows us to operate on the inner success value in even in both cases. So you'll see the implementation of the success one is we just apply the function to the value, and in the error case, we just continue to return the error. And flat map is very similar, but instead of returning a new value, we return a new result type. So the, the success implementation just looks like returning whatever that function returned. And again, the error implementation, we just, again, return the error. The API that gets us in the end, though, is pretty nice, right? We In this code, there's zero error handling. We just continue to pass that up the chain. And the result type that's inferred is a nicely formatted result type, which is nice. You'll notice that this code actually looks shockingly similar to a promise.then chain, and that's because they're basically the same thing. In both cases, we have some kind of wrapper type and some kind of inner type. So promise t or like result t. And they both provide an interface where we can provide some kind of function that operates on that inner t. And this is actually what a monad is, if you've heard that word before, but it really doesn't matter for this case. And so just like how we took async await and provided syntactic sugar on top of dot then, it'd be really great if we could get the same kind of like synchronous looking code with this error handling and result type. But how? This is actually something that many other languages have implemented. Take Rust, for example. So in this example, we have two different functions that both return a result type. And in our main function, we use this question mark operator, which does the equivalent of if this is an error, return the error, otherwise continue with the function. And what this means is just like with async await, we can write this code that actually has this kind of extra behavior, but for the purposes of this function, we just continue as if we operate on every kind of successive success path. And so the question becomes, can we do this in JavaScript? And my answer is yes. So check out this example. It's basically the same thing. I've just changed our previous result type to this new effect type and our previous kind of success and fail constructors to these effect.fail and effect.succeed constructors. And so now we have three different functions, right? We have divide, which could either succeed with a number or fail with a divide by zero error, may fail one, which could succeed with a string or fail with a foo error, and may fail two, which could succeed with a string or fail with a bar error. And so if you look at our main function now, you'll notice that we have this kind of weird generator syntax, which if you actually kind of just squint your eyes just a little bit, it looks almost like async await, right? Instead of awaiting a promise, we're going to yield this function that returns an effect. And so you'll notice that this function returns an effect number, and what we get back from yielding it is just the number. And this is the same with every other place where we use this, right? We function that returns an effect string, and we get back the string. Well, where did the errors go? it's inferred to the return type. The return type is an effect that could fail with the union of all three possible errors. How is this possible? Well, a lot of type wizardry, but the effect team have done that for you. You don't have to think about it at all. And to bring it back to the beginning, this is all enabled because effect handles expected errors and unexpected errors completely separately. And so let's check out what it looks like to handle an expected error versus an unexpected error in effect. When we handle an expected error, everything is fully typed. We know that there could be a divide by zero error, and we know that that divide by zero error has a string tag of divide by zero error. So we can specifically check for that, and we know that if that's the case, the exact type we get. And effect is actually smart enough to say that now that we fully handled that error, we can remove it from the type. On the other hand, an expected error called a defect in effect is always typed unknown, right? This is the same as try catch, just a little bit different syntax. All this code is from a library called effect, which has a ton of amazing features outside of just this beautiful compositional error handling. But whether you use effect or not, everyone has to handle errors. And so I hope after watching this, you have a better understanding of the difference between expected versus unexpected errors, why TypeScript will never have a throw statement, and some ways to handle errors as values. If effect sounds interesting to you, you should definitely check out my other videos about it. I just posted a really cool one about its structured concurrency implementation. But other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.